Okay. I'm seeing the numbers slow down and we are starting a little bit late. So I am going to kick us off. Thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to this exciting event. Today is the launch of the Ongea Mama Speak series. The theme is African feminist politics, leadership and participation. And the series is a collaboration between the African Women's Development Fund and Black Women Radicals. The series features, as you're gonna to see today, formidable African feminist scholars, activists and organizers in conversations. Panelists will interrogate the state of African feminist politics, how African feminists have and continue to say, shape social movements on the continent and transnationally. Today, we have a two hour program for you that begins like everything that's good does with some poetry. Um, we're gonna start with spoken word by Dr. Stella Nyanzi called Speaking Truths to Feminist Power, some personal reflections. After Stella's spoken word, you're gonna be able to have questions and pose questions to her about her spoken word. And then we'll move to the artist Uyala. The artist Uyala is the lioness of Africa and a Ghanaian singer and songwriter. And then we're gonna to move to conversation with our panelists, Nala Simon Toussaint, Mai Panaga, Wumpini Mohammed, and Amina Mama. I'm not gonna introduce them now, I'm gonna do that when we go into the panel, but after the panel, you'll also have the opportunity to ask the panelists some questions before we close out the event. Today, we're using the hashtags Ongea Mama series, Black Feminist Solidarity and Black Feminist Leadership. So please do tweet out, follow the conversation also on Twitter. I believe the conversation is also being live streamed on YouTube on the AWDF site and Black Women Radicals site. We have interpretation for you today in French, Portuguese and Arabic. It's always a bit strange to say because you're hearing me in English before I give the instructions of the translation and I do not speak these other languages. So I can't say it in all the other languages. But those of you who know Zoom know how to do this by now. The globe is on the bottom and you can choose the language that you'd like to hear the conversation in. I believe we may also have international sign language, but not sure that's yet set up. So we're, we're still figuring that out. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Stella is an academic scholar trained as a medical anthropologist and artist who specializes in writing poetry. She publishes online and in books, an activist for diverse social justice causes, and an agitator. I love that word for liberation in Uganda, where she's a member of the opposition party called the Forum for Democratic Change. Currently, she is a scholar of the Writers in Exile program of Penn, Germany. She lives in exile in Germany with her three teenage children. Stella, can I move it over to you? Thank you very much. Thank you, Hakima, for a brilliant uh, introduction. I'm also very grateful to AWDF, the African Women Development Fund, and the Black Women Radicals for the opportunity for creating the space, but also for inviting me. I'm excited to be invited among feminists because a lot of feminists in my country hate me. They cannot stand my guts and they don't understand the sort of feminist praxis I do. And so it's wonderful when feminist African sisters embrace me. Some of my work has been called an African. I will do readings from a book called No Roses from My Mouth that I wrote in prison. I was imprisoned uh, for writing a poem that offended the president's sensibilities in my countries. And the poem I choose to read is called Women Shall No Longer Wait. So spoken word that's read, let's see how that goes. Women shall no longer wait. Women shall no longer wait for absent men to drive these poisonous snakes out of our houses. We pick up your machetes rusting away and chop the venomous snakes into many pieces. Women 
shall no longer wait for castrated men to carry the coffins of kin killed by the state. We wear your trousers and your kanzus and lift the caskets to graves dug by ourselves. Women shall no longer wait for timid men to fight for the liberation of Uganda. We pack missiles in our pens and grenades in our mouths and shoot at roots at the dictatorship. Women shall no longer wait for blinded men to drive us to the promised beautiful land. We thicken the muscles of our legs and ride ourselves to freedom on bicycles and cars, on bicycles and cars, on bicycles and cars. Women shall no longer wait for faceless men to woo, love, or pleasure us. We wear dildos dipped in oil and inseminate ourselves with stronger sperm. That's the first poem. And the second one, because we're talking about solidarities, I want to read um, a poem I wrote, Feminists in High Heels, in response to some of the feminists in Uganda and how they respond to my work. It comes from the same book, No Roses from My Mouth. Feminists in high heels. Feminists in high heels stick their noses in the air and sniff at my dust covered sneakers. They point their tight breasts at patriarchy and smack at my saggy bust. They push their bottoms outwards as if they never shit. They dim my activism too grounded. She's too dirty to be one of us. Feminists in power suits shake their ponytails and ridicule my three-piece kitengi. They cling onto their briefcases and shun my papyrus chikapo. They stretch forward their manicured fans and sneer at my short-trimmed fingernails. They deem my advocacy too radical. She's too hot to be one of us. <laughs> Feminists drunk with religion roll their judgmental eyes heavenward. <laughs> and they shandera ma 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 shandera ma 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 shandera ma 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 at my brazenness. They finger their scriptures, leather bound scriptures, and distance themselves from my activism. They pray and praise and tithe, but keep away from the trenches. They dim my praises too immoral. She's too worldly to be one of us. And um, one of the celebrated sisters in Uganda is the former speaker of parliament. I wrote a poem um, with a lot of rage and I dedicated it to her, a short little poem called Honorable Becky's Vagina. It's from my book called Don't Come In My Mouth, Poems That Rattled Uganda. And uh, I want to thank AWDF for buying a few copies of this book. Honorable Becky's Vagina. Today, hey, today, today I'm finding sisterhood difficult. I refuse to stand with Sister Becky. I don't ally my vagina with this woman. Her dry eyed excuses for bribe money leave my vulva lips sealed and dry. Her loud, furious shouts in Parliament leave my clitoris hidden deep down. Her frenzied screams of disagreement at the Attorney General dry my inner wells. Her insults at MPs who sought court's intervention kill my libido for weeks. Her chastisement of Bobby for returning the bribe shames my womanhood. And so I am cold with embarrassment and shame at the Speaker of Parliament. I find no sisterly spark for this shrewdly cold calculating bitch in power. Will our small vaginas continue supporting big vaginas that dryly steal from the public purse? How does Becky's vagina in parliament serve our poor vaginas in the COVID-19 era? Um, a little short poem about motherhood because I've been called a monster too evil to be a mother is entitled An Up Close Mother that I wrote um, towards um, the end of the COVID-19 um, lockdown in Uganda. 
I'm an up-close mother. I am relearning to be an up-close mother in this COVID-19 lockdown. The simplicity of doing my daughter's hair is one of my favorite lockdown tasks. I did dandruff, brush, oil, spray, and style her thick mop of dreadlocks. The boys leave us to it. It is just my daughter and I. We talk and laugh. We catch up on life. We plan and we worry aloud together. We share jokes. <laughs> we gossip about the people in our lives. We discuss love and politics. We rhythm and we rhyme. I plan to continue being an up-close mother even after the COVID-19 lockdown is lifted. And the very last poem I wrote for the launch of this that I think is an important series. Um, and to celebrate the series, I wrote, Speak, Mommy, Speak. Ongea, Mama, Ongea. Yogera, Mama, Yogera. Parle, Mama, Parle. Spreche, Mutter, Spreche. Speak, Mommy, Speak. Speak even when you are weak. Speak in a sharp, terrified squeak. Speak in English that they click. Speak and confuse them in what sounds like Greek. Speak through layers of silence thick. Speak to shame. Speak through shame. Speak against shame that strives to stick. Speak even when they say you're a freak. Speak and stomp and rave to a peak. Speak gently, for they say you're meek. Speak slowly, and when they're slow, be quick. Speak regardless of state power calling you seek. Speak and teach crowds what makes you tick. Speak in metaphors of power till they crawl, they call their shriek. Speak thin, and after research, speak thick. So when in your old kitengi, amidst women in par suits who are sleek, speak. Speak like the caged bird using its beak. Speak, it's no longer time to turn the other cheek. Speak, don't hold back your defiant prick. Speak to younger women and share your trick. Speak to challenge the big man with a big dick. Speak loud and bold before your bucket you kick. Speak to connect and to give their ears a lick. Speak respectfully and reflexively when necessary. Speak with tongue in cheek. Speak and listen and speak and listen and speak. Speak, mommy, speak. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I look forward to sharing, receiving from the other sisters. Thank you very much. Ella, thank you for starting us off so beautifully with this launch and with this event. I don't know if you're seeing the applause that you're getting in the chat, all the recognition and the love. It's really beautiful to see people from all over the world, from Algeria, Kenya, DRC, Cameroon, South Africa, Colombia. I'm seeing people from everywhere singing your praises and saying thank you, Stella. We have a little bit of time. If you have any questions for Stella, please put them in the Q&A and I will be happy to ask Stella your questions. But I'm gonna to turn to our panelists to ask as well. Do you have any questions for Stella for her, about her poetry, about her spoken word? Amina, I see you giggling. Please unmute. Ask Stella. <laughs> uh, good day, Stella. And I'm delighted to see you metamorphose. I don't know if you did poetry before, but first of all, congratulations on morphing from medical anthropologist to poet. And I think you probably have found a far more powerful 
um, from an activist perspective, a, a far more powerful weapon. Um, I'm going to just push you on this one and say, well, uh, Kadaga was never a feminist and these women in high heels are generally very anti-feminist. So I'm gonna ask if you actually mean the feminists in high heels, because we have you know, so many different kinds and the feminists I know and associate, most of us can't wear heels and we can very lick, you know, so there's those, I, I think we need to be a bit discerning because everybody attacks feminists. So we do need to self critique, but let, let's, let's, let's be, you know, a little discerning there and not, you know, I'm worried for people who don't know Uganda that they might think Kadaga is one of the feminists um, and, I, and she's a, a, the speaker in the house and this regime is profoundly anti-feminist. So I want to draw the line between the regime and all those who it's manipulated and the feminists in Uganda. I was there two weeks ago and, and wonderful women on the ground, albeit not as audacious as yourself, because they're still living in Uganda. So there's a kind of a question there. How is it to be in Germany? And I think you've switched weapons because of your location. Am I right? Right, thank you very much. Um, wonderful <laughs> feedback, good to see you. Um, and have I morphed or have part of my other attributes become public. Maybe. I think even before I learned to write as an academic, I was writing poetry in school. My first degree, my Bachelor of Arts uh, uh, at Makerere University is in mass communication and literature. And in literature, I specialized in poetry at undergraduate level. But before that, when I was about nine years old, I got in trouble at school for writing poems mm -hmm. against a new white teacher that we received. And so I think that a lot of my poetry has been private for diaries about love and pain and grief and war. But what happened when the university shut me out mm -hmm. uh, in Uganda, and this is 20, I think I staged my nude protests at the university in 2016. By that time, I had begun writing re resistant poetry quite defiantly because it circulates easier than academic journal articles. So <laughs> I, it did, I didn't need to get out of Uganda to first publicly write in quite naughty poems. But your question about um, <laughs> feminists and, and Rebecca Kadaga. So one of the things I want to say is when Yoweri Museveni, uh, the dictator in power in Uganda, is praised for bringing women from the backyard to the from the kitchen to, 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 to the center hold of power, Rebecca Kadaga is given as an example of the sort of feminist uh, successes, and it's called feminist work of the NRM government. When women in power sit to celebrate the attainments of the affirmative action, so the 1.5 points given to allow women to go to school, the opening of parliament for women, those feminists embrace and celebrate Rebecca Kadaga. And I came to a point where Uganda Women Movement members said to me, who are you to say she is not a feminist? What are these divisions within feminism that you are reproducing in Uganda if she is not radical and queer and uh, pro-abortion and pro-sex work like you are, does that disqualify her from being a feminist? And she's, they say to me, she's done gender in development, gender for development, women in, you know, she's done all the depoliticized forms of feminist work. And I came in confrontation with the wide spectrum of what feminism is interpreted to be in Uganda. And so, why I then decide to reproduce myself and circulate myself as a queer and radical feminist. It is my refusal to associate with other forms of feminism that are very, they're full of vitriol in my country and some of their experts are homophobic, are anti-transgender women, are opposed to some of the more radical feminist modes of doing political work in parliament, such as making laws that legislate abortion and legislate sex work and decriminalize homosexuality, etc, etc. Having said that, I think that the Uganda women's movement has got all extremes. <laughs> and um, while I may sit on the extreme end, it would be interesting if we had an inclusive space of African feminists in Uganda 
I wouldn't be surprised if Rebecca Kadaga showed up and she would be embraced by the Uganda women's movement. Does that therefore, so, 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 so that is part of my positioning. So my critique against anti, uh, uh, against feminists in, in high heels is a very specific type of feminism the NGO type of feminism that is well-oiled and has almost no touch with the reality on the ground. And I think that poetry allows me to work with extremes, color it like it is, slap them in the face. And then when questions as importantly as yours are asked, I mean, sometimes I wear high heels. Does it make me a feminist in high heels? Does it remove my critic? I think that what poetry does so beautifully that perhaps other genres cannot do is to throw the issues in the air and then invite debate and discussion, or it invites imprisonment and banishment, if one is unlucky like me, or it invites uh, celebration and accolades and awards. But I think that Feminists in High Hills has then been taken on as a poem that younger, often younger, more radical sorts of feminists uh, used to enter difficult conversations around what the feminist organizing in Uganda is doing. So it's not so much mm. about the high heels as the invitation to discuss feminism in Uganda. And I was, I was pleased when it went beyond Ugandan circles because I was writing this in prison and um, feminists in high heels came to visit me. They were actually wearing high heels. And <laughs> as a prisoner, I wasn't allowed to sit on a chair. Mm. I had to sit at their feet on the floor. Mm. And it was interesting that only my lesbian friend was wearing sneakers and I was in slippers, like bathroom slippers. Anyway, um, so, so some of the metaphors of shoes and, and what they do for women and activism is important because I thought coming to prison in high heels, my word, <laughs> how away from the reality of the person they've come to visit are these women, but they came in solidarity. So, so what does solidarity mean across layers, across slippers and bare feet and feet with jiggers and scars and high heels and pumps and God knows what else. Thank you, Stella. Thank you for the poetry that invites so many questions and important discussions about how we understand our feminisms in the plural, how feminism gets co-opted and what that means then for those of us who maybe take on a more radical uh, queer feminism. You've been invited in the chat by Liz in Uganda to, to please write some poetry around trans women in Uganda. Um, there is also a question for you around how to navigate a world with so many feminists with high heels. And I think you've spoken to that. I, and I, what I heard, but tell me if this is, this is right, is it's not so much a navigation, but also a way of confronting and having a conversation about what, what that feminism is related to that. Um, there's a question about African feminism. What are, what are our demands to African society? I imagine that's a question for all of us once we start the panel conversation, because it's a, it's a big question. Um, and again, related, there's a question about African culture. It's framed as African culture detests feminism. So how have you managed the African culture as a feminist? And, Am I allowed to answer a little bit as, as the facilitator? <laughs> That's, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it because I, I believe you are creating African culture. So we shouldn't just put, assume that anything, or that African culture is patriarchal culture. There is liberatory African culture that we are consistently making as Africans. Uh, among them, the poetry of Stella. Um, so Stella, can I hand over those wide ranging questions to you. We have about 10 minutes left before we're going to go into hearing uh, some music from Riala. Right. Thank you very much. Um, also, thank you to the different commenters. Amazing, amazing applause and affirmation 
in the comments, the, the chat section, I didn't read everything, but everything seems to be so positive, good feedback. Um, rarely do I get um, this sort of positive feedback. So I thank you as well for, for tackling the question. I think the questions are for the whole series. They're not just for me or for you or for the panelists, but I hope these are questions we shall continue to debate as the series unfolds because they are also important. And I think in terms of resetting the agenda that it's spaces like these where all sorts of feminists and anti-feminists converge that we reset agendas and recreate cultures. As an anthropologist, one of our, our sort of cliche offerings to the world is that culture is not fixed, it's flexible, it changes. And I think one of the things I love to do is to be named among the Ugandan women who shamelessly reintroduced new ideas or seemingly new ideas into definitions of Ugandan's women's culture. So to give other women permission if they say, ah, if that's Telanyazi could do it, why can't we do it? Or if someone, as they say, I'm mentally sick, if someone as mentally ill as Telanyazi can go so far, what about you who is not mentally sick? Why don't you do something? And I think um, that, that this is important to do, to, 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 to reshape culture, to be able to, 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 to embrace all of us. And I think the elasticity of culture is what I want to keep pulling and tagging at and packing it in a bit some more. So it should be accommodating for all of us. Um, I think that African culture is a reifying title. There are many Africans and there are many cultures. So it should be Africans cultures <laughs> and everything is plural and negotiated and in flux with me. And I think I like the different inflections of Africa that we have from from so-called indigenous Africans to Africans in Africa, to Africans in diaspora, to Africans in exile, to Africans online, and all these geographical location or spatial spaces represent Africa. So Africa in diaspora used to be like, hey, oh my God, that tree is Africa. But now there's Africa online, virtual Africa. So welcome, how can it be pure and, 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 and unpolluted. I love the pollution and the contamination, but maybe it's not pollution, but maybe it's a coloring and a reshaping of what we do. Um, so African culture versus African feminism. I mean, the, the impolite, the impolite, the impolite response for me usually to that is like, fuck you, like respectfully, fuck you, don't say that. The examples of feminist power that I draw from are, 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 are pure African, my grandmother, my mother, my sisters, okay, and sisters now writ large, but also mothers, I have mothers who bathed me, mothers from my family, but mothers in academia. I mean, I was at uh, AGI, I was at Africa Gender Institute when, Afri when a prof, um, I mean, a mama was there as director. Was that motherhood or not? <laughs> I have participated at the Pambazuka in the book series. I, 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 I worked with um, Sylvia Tamale on a book, and I think Hakima at the time, you were at Pambazuka. Isn't that a form of motherhood, although not about vaginas and reproduction? It's a specific sort of social reproduction where we recognize authority that ushers us into particular worlds. And so my, my birthing into African feminism comes very much from an Africa place, an African identity, an African women. And I get so infuriated that, that, that I turn to, 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 to vulgar language to, in response to people who say, ah, oh, but African feminism is not African. That is so tired. <laughs> it is so tired that we need to keep justifying what we are and what we do. So what do you call me? I'm African, I'm woman, I'm feminist. How can what I do not be African? How can it be an influence of the West? But of course, one listens to the critique about what are these foreign strange ideas or seemingly strange and foreign ideas that we want to bring home. If fighting for gender equity and gender equality and the recognition of humanness for other gendered people who are not necessarily masculine or man um, is foreign, then I don't want to be part of that which is called indigenous. <laughs> if to be indigenous means to oppress alternative genders and minority genders and women and girls, then I don't want to be part of that core 
which insists on pushing us to the sidelines because my sort of Africanness <laughs> embraces the totality of humanity and we're all human and it's about Ubuntu. And I think the idea that Ubuntu is about men being in power should be contested. That, that we should start gendering what Ubuntu means. It was not only elderly men who sat around the fire to discuss, um, it was also men and women. Um, so I realized time, uh, the invitation to write about trans men and inter trans women, I think it was. Mm -hmm. In my work, in my work on prison, the book on prison, a lot of my confiscated poems that were burnt by the prison wardresses included romantic relationships in prison. So lesbians, women kissing women, sex in the bathrooms. Uh, but also friendship and intimacies between prisoners and prison, prison wardresses. This is women relationships. Uh, masculine women playing masculine roles in largely woman-centered spaces where we had women taking on the roles of men, but also transgender identified women who were imprisoned during pride or in cases involving extortion and blackmail, or even in cases um, of canon knowledge against the order of nature would come to prison. And we often sought each other out, not so much to have, um, but, but, but solidarity, to draw solidarity from each other and plan and strategize about ways out of court. So I have a lot of those poems that were confiscated. A few of them survived and got published in my first book. And I think one that's particularly been quite popular is called Intersex in Prison. It's dedicated to a son of mine who, who everybody called a man and they called my son, although we were all locked up together in a women prison. And another one is about a, a lesbian relationship that that son of mine had, because again, they insisted in that relationship, there were lesbians, he was no longer a transgender man. And so I sort of have some poetry in my first book around the, 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 the trans and intersex and um, lesbian world. Um, but yes, I, I, I accept the, the, the invitation. Um, I probably haven't answered everything that I was asked. But, no, you, um, you did great, Stella. I'm gonna move us to the music, but what I would love for you to do, Stella, is if you could stay with us until the conversation with the panelists. And I think I'll bring both you and Riella back and then we can all have a conversation and, and finish up some of these really juicy bits. And because I'm still seeing the chat on fire, thank you so much everyone for contributing and asking questions. Um, we have about 150 people in attendance. Um, before I forget, because you know, we're gonna get meaty later and I have a feeling I'm not gonna get to this. So I want to do it now. I want to really thank the whole team at AWDF and the whole team at Black Women Radicals who got us here today. Behind the scenes, you've been awesome. You've really helped us coordinate this and get us all here. So we thank you greatly. I also want to thank the interpreters who are helping us speak to one another across our different languages. Wiala, the lioness of Africa, please come forward. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wiala. I'm a singer, songwriter. And uh, sometimes I do a bit of acting and modeling, but I'm known for music and dance. And I'll sing a song, and it's Africa. And I think it's an appropriate song for me to sing. And here it goes. It's in English and a little bit in my local dialect. The land is good. The land is fine. Gold we have. Diamonds we buy. Yet we fight. We cover it all in blood. Tell me why we were low in the mud. Africa, 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 yeah. Mama Africa, we cried for peace. Africa, the land is good, the land is fine. Gold we have, diamonds we mine. 
He had to wait for it. We covered it all in blood. Tell me why we were low in the mud. Africa, 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 hey, Mama Africa, we cry for peace. Africa, the summer got to give to your run. Yeah, summer got to give. Tayora, Tell me why we fight. Tell me why we fight. Just tell me why we fight. Tell me why we fight. Africa, 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 Africa Day. Thank you. You can check it out on YouTube. It's called Africa by We Are and other things. Thank you. <laughs> we are Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And it really grounds us in why we are all here today for Africa, about Africa. Um, and you will see again in the chat. So many people, even before you said it was on YouTube, people were posting the song. <laughs> Everyone is ready to give you your flowers. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And I will invite you to come back in when we come to the conversation. And now I'm going to ask Amina, Mpini, Nala, and Mai to come forward. I know you can't do it. I know that Malaika has to do it for us. Yes, Mpini, I see you. Okay, can we get everybody pinned? In the meantime, I am going to try to introduce our panelists for today. You all have wonderfully deep and long bios, which I am not going to read. I am just going to abbreviate, but I'm going to ask our dear friends uh, at AWBF to post your full bios in the chat so that we have them. So you'll forgive me for, for abbreviating the bios somewhat. <laughs> but so the conversation that we have today, we have Dr. Wumpini Fatimata Mohammed, who uses she, her pronouns and is a Ghanaian feminist activist scholar and assistant professor of global media in the College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia. Her research focuses on feminisms, decolonialization and media, and they've appeared in various scholarly journals. She's also worked as a journalist in Ghana for several years. We also have Nala Simon Toussaint, who uses goddess, she, her, they, who is a Brooklyn born with Afro-Caribbean background, Nala Toussaint works to advance the social and economic well-being of African descendants with an urgent focus on queer, same gender loving people, transgender and non-binary people, and ultimately the entire community. She's a healer, influencer and activist. Welcome Nala. We also have Dr. Amina Mama, who is a Nigerian British transdisciplinary feminist scholar and supporter of African women's movement making. She's the founding editor of Feminist Africa. She's currently the first woman to occupy the Kwame Nkrumah chair in African studies at the University of Ghana, where she curated the Kwame Nkrumah festival. If you missed the festival, please check out on YouTube all of the amazing panels that happened there. She holds a tenured professorship at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. Welcome, Amina. 
Finally, last but not least, we have Maya Panaga, who is a Sudanese woman based in Cairo and is the co-founder and co-editor of the Cairo-based Ihtia. I'm saying that wrong, Mai. I know, it's okay, forgive me. Feminist Collective. Ihtia, meaning choice in Arabic, aims to promote and educate the community on gender and sexual equality. And since 2014, Mai has been devoted to feminist knowledge production in Arabic, covering areas of feminism, sexuality, and the feminist internet. I am super excited to have you all here. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to do just a first quick round, okay? <laughs> Got to be quick. All right. The question is, who has inspired your politics? We're going to name one or two people, only max two, okay? And tell us why, why they've inspired your politics. Can I go first to you, Nala? Ah! <laughs> In my house, like, don't go for me first. Ah, oh, who has inspired? Um, some of the the folks who have inspired me are those who are no longer with us. I think I think my work is rooted in um, pre genocide work, and so where I find my inspiration of why it continues to carry me is those who have made a way for me to be here. Um, those who have uh, allowed and created space for my voice to be heard, um, who have taught me to be an interruption. So some names I can think of is Islan Nettles, um, uh, who was a trans sister like myself, who was in fashion design, who was trying to find her voice. And one day she was catcalled and she used her voice and that voice led her to her death. And so I think about the power of voice and being able to uh, say no or to fight for what's right. So that's someone who comes to my mind. And I think about the, uh, the ones who are living as well, who mold me, who uh, hold me accountable, who circle me and say, no, go this way or go this way, or this is why you should consider this. So I think it's not a one person is a collective for me. That makes sense. That makes a huge amount of sense. And I have a feeling that answer will come around again. <laughs> Amina, can I go to you? Hi. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, was, I struggled a little bit with this question because there are the names that jumped to mind and I had to think back on why. Um, because for a long time I, I didn't, it didn't have heroes. I, I think it comes from being very irreligious. So I was very anti-idolatry, anti-worship. And the people, the heroes, heroes, they were mostly heroes that everyone embraced. I didn't feel anything about, you know, so, so I was anti-heroes for a long time. Um, and I was very anti-white femininity. Uh, no doubt there's a personal trajectory there. So I sort of discovered heroes first through books. So it would be uh, Cabral, Fanon, you know, the names. But then in real life, I started looking locally for my heroes and I found them. I had six aunts. Uh, I disagree with them on most things. They're religious and I'm not um, in a conservative way. You know, I love space for radical faith, but uh, conservative colonial faith, no. So it took me a while, but then I, I, I learned about Mrs. Kuti and now the whole world knows about Mrs. Kuti, Fumilayo Kuti, um, thanks to the fact that there is a biography. And that made me think, well, where are all the other women? There's only that one. Uh, so, so, you know, what I wanna say is that my heroes have not been, heroes have not been written. So I want us to look for them. It would be uh, someone like Hadja Gambo Sawaba, who happens to be from my father's part of Nigeria in Bida, in the middle of nowhere. Well, she was also half Ghanaian. Very interesting life. It hasn't been properly researched, investigated. I'm excited. I discovered she has relatives here alive, so I'm after them. But so the unwritten stories, Hannah Kujo, the biggest political figure in Nkrumah's Ghana, nobody knows anything about her. You know, so, so these things, so, so my mind is the search for Shiro's. 
Um, so I'm not satisfied with the elevated ones of today, the high heeled ones, Stella. I'm not happy with the femocrats. I'm not happy with so many. So, so I think we have more digging. We, we need to bring forth our sheroes, the real ones, you know, the ones we really feel for. And I only have those two right now. Oh, Claudia Jones. Yes, Claudia Jones, probably one of my more enduring sheroes. The um, mm. Trinidadian communist who was imprisoned, and people know her story. Again, thank you, Carol. There's now a biography, but I knew her before that. Her picture was on the wall of a Black women's center in London. I discovered her when I was very young through that image and fell for her, basically. Then there's this book, 20, 30 years mm. later. So we're filling out work to do. Yes, and the importance of finding our sheroes amidst all the noise. Wumpini, can I go to you? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I am inspired by feminist, um, my feminist ancestors of Northern Ghana, whose organizing uh, and resistance work has been erased in national memory and formal accounts of the Ghanaian feminist movement uh, histories. I'm also inspired by feminist elders who have contributed to knowledge building in my community that has benefited and continues uh, to benefit the collective. I'm inspired by feminist elders who have done so much with so little in the face of um, disenfranchisement and erasure. And I'm also inspired by feminist siblings who are thrusting the work of um, these disenfranchised women into spaces where they have so often been excluded. Um, I'm inspired by the resistance and resilience of the subaltern in the face of multiple oppressions. So I don't have singular heroes. And I'm also beginning to learn more about um, uh, my feminist ancestors whose um, stories have perpetually been um, erased from the uh, Ghanaian public sphere and Ghanaian um, national cultural uh, memory. Thank you. So that theme of the collective and the erasure comes up a lot when we ask the question, who inspires you? Mai, over to you. Um, so I did struggle with the question because I prepared like the longest list possible, uh, but then I decided to think about what inspires me. And um, I'm someone who is shaped by knowledge and uh, knowledge finds its way to me even before I find my way uh, into feminist spaces. And um, so I'm inspired by the labor of uh, knowledge production and words and the way it shapes us and the way it allows us to ask questions and formulate our own ideas. Um, many people worked uh, on knowledge that I don't think they expected to reach someone in Egypt sitting in a room looking to make sense of the word and uh, they filled the room with so many questions and ideas and that still to this day um, make me questions even the you know your own ideology sometimes and, and reshape it every two days <laughs> and then you come with a new idea and you have all of those conversation. Um, I'm shaped by anthologies and poetry and beautiful words. Uh, I'm shaped by um, um, academic who put out their work uh, to make it more accessible for the rest of us who could not make it uh, to academia. Um, I'm shaped to, uh, by work uh, from, I will just throw some names, uh, the African, um, the feminist African journal. We were used to read it like, just with, <laughs> with a pencil and be like, oh my God, we're all. And, um, and recently, uh, the Feminist Consciousness, they are a group uh, who's working from Western Sahara uh, while working uh, for their own self-determination and uh, the kind of work they put out there, it's amazing. And it's um, reminding us that there's so much to know and learn from each other. I'm grateful for every writer, editor, translator, and everyone who made sure that this knowledge is accessible to us because without it, I wouldn't be sitting here. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Mike. So I hear in this inspiration, lots of themes around the collective, the erasure, and also the knowledge production, and then the need for these platforms that allow us to see who is doing, who did what, when they did it, how they did it, and the translation and the conversations. Thank you all so much for sharing who inspires you. You'll also see that folks are sharing in the chat. 
which is beautiful. Um, someone also talked about grandmothers. That's a special one for me because my grandma also inspired me. I'm going to launch into questions and I'm going to start with you, Amina, if that's okay. Can I start with you? Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> you are, you mentioned Kwame Nkrumah, you mentioned Cabral, and I think you said maybe Nyerere, Amafro, Nyerere, Sankara, all those yes. people. You're currently the Kwame Nkrumah chair at the University of Ghana, the first woman to hold this position. Kwame Nkrumah is, as we all know, among our most preeminent thinkers on Pan-Africanism. How does Pan-Africanism as a theory and practice contribute to African feminisms and vice versa? How does African feminisms contribute to Pan-Africanism? Thanks for that question, um, Hakima. It's, yeah, okay, well, I'll take it as it's been phrased. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, there, there haven't been very many Kwame and Kruma chairs, so I'm going to start with the diffidence. They've only been, I'm only the fourth, so there's a lot of chance for them to actually make this gender equitable moving forward. Uh, the question will be in 20 years, have there been at least 10 women? Um, that's when you can begin to see. I don't know if it will exist that long. Um, being given, offered that chair and make it, finding it possible to come and uh, be here for, for over a year has been a huge privilege. And it's given me the opportunity to actually revisit. You know, I've been like anti-hero. I read some of these people, men a long time ago and then moved on from them. Um, and then started reading more and more women, became a feminist and, you know, sort of let them fade into my background. And that's all the men that you've listed and, and others who we read on the side of our formal education, looking for inspiration. Um, now I've had the chance to reread and I mean, there's a, a number of things. Uh, so I set up the festival to interrogate exactly this question. What is the exchange between Pan-Africanism and feminism? And to actually create that exchange. Um, so I think they feed each other and it's more visible now since we have more Pan-African platforms, um, both on the continent and in terms of the diaspora. So we can actually speak of a Pan-African feminism because we have a feminist charter. And generally what feminists have meant by that, and you know this as well as I, is continentalism. It's only the sort of, and here in Ghana, Pan-Africanism means diaspora. It doesn't mean the continent. I've learned that here to my astonishment um, because this is the home of Pan-Africanism, but um, they mean diaspora, not Ghana. And I think that is to do with the very deep contradictions around Nkrumah's legacy. They hate him and they love him. They killed him and they feel bad, but on the other hand, they celebrate him. But if you go to his memorial, there's a beheaded statue with the head on the side that greets you when you go to the tomb. And I think that, I, that imagery, so why is this headless statue here? That was just one moment, the coup, in front of the mausoleum. So we hate and love, uh, you know, uh, uh, key characters who made profound differences to African history. And of course he was voted, as people may or may not know, he was voted the number one African of the millennium and all the Western world said, why not Mandela? Well, as Africans, we should all know why it was Nkrumah and it is to do with his global perspective on African unity, um, on the unification of Africa and its peoples. And that's his sort of global, end. and then at home. So globally, he was the huge anti-imperialist who took Africa, the hub of African knowledge from diaspora to continent and began the decolonization thing. So all of that, um, and, and so his anti-imperialism, his anti-colonialism, and for me nowadays, the most relevant thing is the way he theorized neo-colonialism, which essentially is a detailed evidenced breakdown of neoliberalism, and he saw it back then. So this is a great thinker. Um, no one should say he was a feminist. It's absolutely not necessary. He predates the feminism that we live and inhabit and create. Um, but definitely some of the things he did 
created the conditions that made it possible for feminism to emerge. And the first is like everywhere, national liberation. If you're colonized, your feminism has severe limitations on it. So the anti-imperialism of feminism, that's feminism taking up the profound plank of Nkrumah's thought. So in being anti-imperialist, I want to say that anti-feminism is standing on that history of anti-imperialism. Um, in being anti-colonial and insisting on breaking down colonialism, that's Nkrumahist. Feminists take it one step further. We break down colonial patriarchy. So I see feminism very much um, as something that originated in radical thought in, you know, and, and, and carry, we carry it forward. So I actually think of feminism, Pan-African feminism as one of Nkrumah's afterlives. And I think that it's hard to see that sometimes. So we need to make those connections because the fate of Africa has been to continuously chop, sever and disconnect us from our most powerful sources. So there's a way in which I'm revisiting heroes, knowing what I said earlier, I don't like heroes, but revisiting them critically and dragging forward the things that actually they did contribute, like free education for women, for everyone, meant that women got free education. So it wasn't that he went out to do girl child or women's education, he, everyone should have education. And that made women, took the opportunity and rose. So that's what I mean about creating the conditions. I don't think he was a feminist. They say the usual things. He adored his mom. Um, yeah, wow. You know, all African men adore their moms. It doesn't mean they're not misogynists, you know, and mother is not the same as partner. So, so um, they say he loved women. Well, so did Che Guevara. These things are not, you know, this, these are not what matters to a political analysis so much. So I would say um, we have to discover and what feminists do is build forward on the legacies of revolutionary Pan-Africanism. Because as we know, Nkrumah's thought split people and it created um, both the revolutionary and supported and funded and trained the revolutionary movements across Africa. But on the other hand, there are those Pan-Africanists who disengaged from that and generally played the cultural card, which is why I'm very cautious about culture because their thing was essentialism, restoration of the great feudal past where men were men and women were women. It was anti-revolution. So you have both these elements, cultural restorationism and cultural determinism, culture is this. And then we have the radical revolution and both those come out of Pan-Africanism, but Nkrumah and the ones we call today come from the revolutionary side and the resonance is via their socialism the commitment to dismantling structures of power and empowering poor people, ordinary people. So, so that's the, um, the point of con connection and interface, if you like. But I think feminism has gone way further than the Pan-Africanist movements. If you just look at feminist education and say, where is the Pan-Africanist curriculum? Do you know what? There isn't one, not even here in Ghana. There isn't one. We don't have a global radical Pan-African curriculum. I want us to have one, you know, but feminists on the other hand have been doing so much educational work. We have plenty of limitations and faults, but you have to agree that feminist movements educate, educate, educate internally. We bring in new people. That's why we quarrel, have to quarrel so much because we're continuously bringing in people at different stages. And that is the engagement that's carrying us forward and enabling us to advance. And maybe we fight a little less violently than men, although I hesitate to say that, but we're not at war with one another. We yeah. set each other, you know, we distress each other. We're not slaughtering each other the way male political actors do. So, and again, he was anti-violent at first, believed in democratic, um, participatory democratic strategies. But by the time he'd been ousted by the military, he embraced armed struggle. And indeed, by that time of his life, Southern Africa was in war because they were given no option. They were attacked and made illegal, so they, they have no political option. So there are a lot of, um, I don't want to say too much about it, but I think um, what I basically would say about Nkrumah and indeed all our heroes is that we do need to revisit them and rebuild on them and add all the, the women who, like the missing disappearance of Hannah Kujo. We need to bring that in. In his biography, he never mentions her name once, mm -hmm. and yet she was right-hand national propaganda secretary. How can that be? 
uh, I analyzed the biography here, it's ghostwritten by a white woman secretary, and I said, aha, well, double erasure, so whatever. But um, that recovery, the thing that I want to emphasize here is this thing about the need for us to rebuild our own continuities in knowledge and in praxis, um, and to, to pull forward. We cannot do, as I said the other day in a grand lecture, um, we cannot still be doing what Fanon describes. There's a famous overused quote, every generation must out of relative obscurity discover its destiny and decide to betray or fulfill it. I want to ask us, it's 2022, Fanon wrote that in 50 something, last half a century ago. Are we still coming out of relative obscurity? If so, we have a big problem. What the have we been doing for 50 years? So I want us to challenge that and say, no, we shouldn't be coming out of obscurity again and again and again every 10 years. No, this is why old, old people like me are getting tired. They say we're getting tired. <laughs> <It's a lie. laughs> um, but just to say, no, no, we need to be building. So this thing about cultivating a transgenerational, transcontinental um, praxis is, is a very serious one. It's about building our own historic, radical historic continuities and powering ourselves forward. So my interest in Krumer actually centers around his theory of neocolonialism because it is so exact and so useful and so powerful. And the main point I would emphasize in that, if I have time, is the knowledge arena. He talks about the shift from colonial to neocolonial and the shift being mainly the art of insinuation. And this is the area of intelligence. CIA got rid of him and many others. It's about intelligence work. It's about covert operations. It's not about the military. And these ones, the covert operations people, including the media and the cultural industries, they work in cohorts, especially with globalization, with global capital. So we actually need to be working on this knowledge arena that, that Mai lifted up so much in her description of what matters to her and what she wishes to lift up. You're absolutely right. We need to ensure that we have a, our own transgenerational um, uh, transfer systems. We need a radical bridging praxis that covers time, our ages and space, our geographies to, to build Pan-Africanism radical edge um, and it, it's challenging work, but that's what uh, back to Nkrumah for a moment. He set up all these where I'm currently based, the ideological school at Winneba, the uh, et cetera, et cetera. He really tried to intervene on that front to forestall what happened, the overthrow and the destruction of his uh, wow. legacy. So I'll leave it there. And I just, just by emphasizing that I think women have carried Pan-Africanism to whole new arenas that the guys are still balking at and not touching. You cannot address Africa, Africa in the world without addressing sexuality. I mean, for the rest of the world, we are sex. We better confront sexual politics or we're in trouble. So. Thank you, Amina. I love it. <laughs> Bringing forward and making that Last radical. Thing, of course, Nkrumah didn't do that. Sorry, your internet's cutting out a little bit. So I'm sorry if I interrupted, but thank you for that piece around how we bring forward, African feminists bring forward on the legacy and bridge forward on the legacy of radical Pan-Africanism. That was wonderful. Can I, you talked about education and I think that's a really important segue to the question that I have for Nala. I'm gonna to move to you, Nala. You're a healer, an influencer, and an activist, but one of your projects you're part of is ROAD, Reuniting of African Descendants, which engages in cultural exchange between Africans at home and in the diaspora. I'd love to know a little bit about the ped pedagogies. Can I say that word in English? Pedagogies that you use for these exchanges and some of the ways that African queer trans feminist knowledges are emerging from these. Yeah, it, it's just, it, when I saw the question, I just, I was like, this is a big question. <laughs> um, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, when you think about reuniting African, 
African descendants and just that word alone, think about where everyone is coming from is that you can't operate and move in a space of knowing. I don't know what I don't know. And so for me, the, the foundation of creating this work was research, right? I come from a fashion design background. You know, my trajectory of my work shifted when my friend got murdered, as I mentioned earlier. And so the only space that was for me while transitioning was research in which trans women were looked at this as a in, in, in like experiments is like they are the cause of HIV, right? And so what my job was to interrupt <laughs> the conversation that these researchers were having around trans women as it compared to HIV and health. And how did I empower them from where I was grieving? So how did I take my pain point and turn into purpose while saying that I see you? And so throughout my years from 2013 to now has been mostly being invited in spaces that are unheard of, unseen, have never been put in books. Uh, I think about conversations like polls where we have everyone learning this new, right, new uh, thing around ballroom scene where you have underground dancing of expression and movement as a form of healing and addressing health disparities in a um, innovative way. And so for me being around and being in and being a part of queer and trans cultures, I've had to also become innovative because many spaces around me were not created for me. The books and the teachings that were being uh, taught to me didn't actually inform me about myself. It didn't inform me about how to protect myself. It didn't inform me about how to love myself and therefore and therefore. So I found myself in the intersection of people who were marginalized, who practice how to love themselves, even in painful ways, even in painful ways. But they figured out a way how to collectively come together, which is how houses were created. And so I start at that point because that has been the foundation of asking the questions, what's missing, what's needed, who needs it, and who gets it, and how quick and how urgent. <laughs> um, and that is still the quest that I am on. And so in 2017, on my travels in South Africa, the first time that I landed uh, on Mother Africa, the soil, there was an energy, a vibration of like, I wanted to cry, I wanted to sob, I wanted to ask what was taking me so long. It was like going home to the Caribbeans. Like I, my, my mom who's Jamaican and my father who's Trinidadian would talk about their stories growing up in like a, a shed together and, and they're sleeping rooms with their siblings and being able to go to the Caribbeans felt good. But when I got to Africa, I was like, cool. It was a, a feeling that I could not explain. It's something that I was missing that I didn't know I was missing, um, right? Um, and then there was the feeling of where's my people, right? And when I asked that question, I wasn't just talking about people who um, shared the same complexion. I was talking about intersection identities, right? I can see people, but I can also see those who were hidden in plain sight. I, I say that as queer and trans people, there's a way of navigating that we move that sometimes is hitting. It's like, you know that we're there, but you know that we're not there because <laughs> of safety. And so I wanted to figure out how do I connect with folks who are living in these intersections on top of, you know, tradition, on top of religion, on top of all trot, all of these things. Um, and even in those things cast out of their own tradition and their own religion because of their choice and their identity. And so it's complex and it's layered. So when I got back to States, I was telling a lot of queer and trans folks about my, my journey and everyone's like, I would love to go to Africa, but I'm scared about um, TSA. I would love to go to Africa, but I'm like, well, why are people of the African diaspora who are also queer and who are also trans are having the butt and the butt and the butt. <laughs> and and it, it was setting in and understanding and hearing. And so for me, the journey began asking questions and asking, doing surveys and doing service for folks living in the US uh, and then doing service for folks who were in Africa who were trans and queer. And I got responses that each person wanted to do something. They wanted to connect, they wanted to learn. Uh, 
they wanted to know about their gender identity from other trans and queer folks, like how to properly bind, you know, what does the journey of queerness and transness looks like for them. And so out of that, I got trusted friends and I started cultivating and having meetings and then started getting inboxes from folks who are in Africa, like telling me about their need. And a lot of the needs were around basic needs, housing, shelter, life-sustaining medication, right? Interrupting government, you know, backlash and basic needs for me are human rights needs. You shouldn't have to fight. You shouldn't have to become a warrior because you're not getting what you need. And for me, I, 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 every night I would figure out ways of how to enter, particularly for trans women. Each day, even till this morning, I have literally gotten a call about a beat up, um, an arrest, um, a killing, right? And so there's also this, this notion that comes with this work about grief, pain. And so the healing part comes for me is that instilling in trans and queer siblings of my, of my own um, how much they are loved, how much they matter, right? And those are not just words, but actually practicing, but also practicing restorative justice, right? I think a lot of this work for me, when you ask about what is the, let's say the method is looking at restorative justice um, from a, 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 friend, a, a frame of how in our diasporic world, we have been hurt, right? Because to acknowledge this work is to also acknowledge how many of us do cast out trans and queer folks, the sexuality part, even in feminism and black radical feminists, there is often a question and a conversation for some about where trans women lie <laughs> and where queer people lie, right? And, and who gets to be feminist and who isn't, isn't feminist. And so restorative justice is looking where the pain points are of exclusion and having space for those voices of why the pain exists and why that cast out pain is there and how that relates to all the other intersection of their lives, such as religion, where there's stories about we celebrate, right? who has interrupted and created space and who's glorified, who have addressed the cast out system, right? But how we still do it in many different ways, little, whether it's color of the skin and so many other layers. So for me was bringing all of that pain into a, a space and I've been, I was able to, to do it for the first time in East Africa, we went to, um, a small group of trans individuals uh, came from the States and went to East Africa, particularly Kenya, Nairobi. Um, and it was important to have it in an intimate space. So we were able to get an Airbnb and rent it out for a day. I mean, for a couple of days and we sat down and we talked. Um, there was workshops that was provided such as learning about toxic masculinity versus healthy existing, right? Looking at individuals who do transition, who are, for example, trans men who sometimes do pick up ways <laughs> that are toxic masculinity. So addressing those things, uh, learning how to properly bind where you are not passing out or, you know, losing circulation, um, learning dance and healing movement techniques where that sheer like voguing, right? Um, cooking, cooking is a part of healing. And so there were, you know, there was someone who was from Kenya who cooked her, her, nas her national dishes and things of that nature. And then along the conference, you know, one of the folks was like, can I, ch can I ch cook one of my dishes? And so what I was seeing it that although I had planned something, things were organically happening. So creating space for people to be people within the space, to share their stories when they felt comfortable to share their stories, to share their pain when they felt comfortable to share their pain, and to also share their method of what they need for forward movement. And so as we sat at the table after the workshops, I felt like every lunch and every dinner was when we were doing the unpacking. And even that was still enough. I, I, could, I could tell you now four days was not enough for what was birthed out of that sharing that space, right? And as vulnerability and time and space exist <laughs> and was created, the real emotion of tears and pain and the softening of, I do wanna hug somebody and feel loved. When I say that it may seem little that a hug 
may go a long way. A hug is so transform transformative, especially for the beings of trans and queer people who have been cast out. I was able to see how the abundance out of the hands of Black women who were queer. A Black queer mom who was cast out was able to cook for us, right? And so for me in this work, I am still on the quest of figuring it out, right? Because there isn't a period full stop when we're talking about re reuniting. There isn't a period full stop. It looks different from every, <laughs> every vantage point, right? Someone who might be in London may have a different experience for someone who is in Ghana, or who's in Nigeria, or who is in Jamaica, or who is in Trinidad, or who is in ha Haiti. Like it all is different. Uh, and so for me it was creating a space where we can exist to have the conversation to talk about the pain and to also create our own solutions instead of being at table where people have a lot of money and are using that money as dangling the carrot and tokenizing folks to say, oh, let me take your pain so that I can get the data so that I can get the money and then we will decide if we give it to you to address your disparities. That's, mm -hmm. that's effed up. <laughs> that is the mm -hmm. effed up way of being. And it still exists when we think about academia and all these other places that are beautiful for the conversation as one of the panelists says for knowledge. But my knowledge was rooted in my grandmother who never went to school, who were storytellers and taught me about herbs that she had to learn in, on the land and how to feed the village with a dollar. That's where my knowledge came from. <laughs> and so I celebrate all those things. And I echo the, the notion of that there are so many stories untold um, uh, from intersex person, from queer single moms um, to sex workers to folks living with HIV and other chronic um, ailments who are thriving and finding ways to thrive, but are oppressed where they are and have to move in that, that being sometimes of small because they don't want to experience more pain. It is a troubling sight uh, for me in this work because you're asking about method, but the method is acknowledging and seeing and, and not pretending that it doesn't exist. The, 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 the method is, I see this person who came to the conference and did not know they could choose their identity, go from having their head down with no voice and silence to the end of the conference being able to speak louder than they came in. For me, if I did nothing else, was to give a space for a person to have a voice to know that their story mattered, to be able to share their, their, their story and to be fed in a way that they had never been fed probably. And to take that method, to take it back to where they call home to do that same. And I was able to see it within weeks. One of the participants got a job within, within I think two weeks she was a she's a cook and she was hired to do for another organization because she was able to say i did this for this organization not only that the culture exchange is also about our clothing we were able to bring you know clothes that were dear to us that was like probably not worn or like anything that was something new sunny wipes uh makeup hair other life-sustaining things that you know i cannot say but just to be able to give what may seem like not enough in the US, right? Because we have to address capitalism, but to say, I, will, I am willing to let go of this to create abundance because I trust that abundance runs through me and that more will come as queer and trans folks who are, when we can look at policy, don't have their basic human rights. And so I look at that space as God's abundance, right? To, to be marginalized, to be oppressed, and to still give. And we see that in our grandmothers. We see that in our mother's mothers, that they created abundance out of their hands from nothing, from a dollar. And so that is the method, is to, to interrupt scarcity. Scarcity in our ways of being, scarcity in our theology, scarcity in education, wherever that may show up, where is scarcity, where we're saying that there isn't enough, but we know there is enough because we learned it from our mothers. We learned it from our grandmothers. I could go on and on. <laughs> I 
I think you're muted. I think you're muted. I am muted. I was saying thank you. Thank you so much, Nala, for giving us so much beauty and clarity in terms of those methods. What the words that come up for me are around particularly home and belonging, but also creating home in different ways, not just as a space, but also as a community, as a connection, as a way of doing. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. Maya, I want to turn to you. You recently led, and you talked about knowledge production. You led a project for the Black Feminist Fund on Black feminist movements in the Middle East and North Africa. And of course, Middle East and North Africa is a contradictory, differing, yeah. large region with different histories of Blackness, anti-Blackness, feminism, patriarchy. Um, even that idea of MENA as a region that kind of takes away North Africa from the rest of Africa has so much embedded in it. How does gender, race, and sexuality show up in today's MENA for Black women and gender expansive people? How are Black feminists in the MENA region resisting and building. Okay, uh, thank you, Hakima. Uh, tough question, tough question. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna start by saying that uh, I sat here and do the mental calculation that I do every time. Who am I sitting here as? Am I representing the MENA? Um, I'm thinking in Arabic and speaking in English, so there's an act of translation currently happening. I'm not that fluent <laughs> as much as I want to. Um, and am I the Sudanese, the Egyptian, the African, the Arab? What is it? And um, this meetings and project that uh, that happened that I was lucky to be part of um, was a chance to put forward all of those questions um, and maybe looking for an answer. Um, what is the status of the black feminist organizing in the MENA? And what do we mean by MENA? And who are we? And how do we connect to each other? Um, and I've been active in the MENA scene for, for a while now. And sometimes you find yourself the only black person in the room and you're explaining so much and then you move to another room and you're presented as the Arab and you just start explaining more. Um, and one of the things that we talked about and that I was lucky to be able to have an honest and open conversation. Um, and then all of those questions turned to a way that we can just we didn't have to translate our experience. Um, and it was virtual rooms, um, but still it felt closer than many spaces that I found myself in. And um, it's the negotiation and fragmentation of being black, women, feminist, gender expansive in the MENA, where there is um, erasure. Uh, when you think of certain countries, you don't think that there is Black people in it. And apparently, this is something. Uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, um, Emirates. And, um, and this erasure is happening um, on a big scale. Um, and a lot of the, I don't say I want to say participant, I would say sisters and comrades and <laughs> um, talked about it as, as a, a crushing reality that they learn to carry on and navigate um, and sometimes led to choices walking into rooms. Uh, which identity am I carrying into this room? Am I walking and talking about my gender or my race or my sexuality? And we are in 222 right now in a time where uh, the feminist movement in the MENA is talking about intersectional approaches and it's still lacking a true understanding of what do we mean by it and how we open our spaces to include, um, you know, those great words that we want to turn to action and reality. Um, so we started from a point where we were looking at the knowledge production uh, regarding uh, Black uh, people and feminism in the MENA. And there was lack, a huge lack. And the way that we said it, it was um, 
academics, white academics, squatting colonizers, which was fun to see. And in, in, in that space, um, there is lack when it comes to critical race lens or gender or anything. And trying to paint the picture that it, there was slavery, but it was different. So it's not really slavery and it have no precaution on the current times uh, and realities. Um, it was something that was happening a long time ago. And um, it was frustrating, but what was also surprising was the lack of um, knowledge regarding um, Black feminism in the MENA from feminist spaces also. That was surprising because um, we always say it like Audrey Willard did talk at every five minutes and every feminist issue is here in the MENA. But uh, you don't invite Black women in your own countries to write. You don't invite them to your spaces. Uh, they're not part of your organization. Um, I've attended many events, especially in those two years of quarantine, where uh, they were speaking about um, Blackness, race, domestic work, kafala system, but not inviting domestic workers or Black women. And that was interesting and uh, frustrating. Um, and, and laughing, honestly, it's not just frustrating. You're sitting there and thinking, hmm, what do you know? <laughs> like you couldn't find a single person to invite. That's interesting. And this is a question that was um, asked uh, regarding uh, the involvement of uh, the feminists that we talked with, um, if they are involved with any, with any of their local organizing. And the answer was no. We walk into the organization, there's no one who looked like us. So it's a clear sign that this is not a space for us where race is only um, talked about um, in terms of, um, I don't want to say it this way, but I wish, uh, Western understanding. Uh, and you're actually quoting and, and, and putting forward the knowledge production that's coming from the West, but none from Africa and none from the name. And this is also something that we need to address. Um, so, and uh, when it comes to the society, there is a total denial of anti-Blackness or racism because it's not structured and um, in a way that can be understood. And whenever someone is speaking about uh, racism or anti-Blackness, they're accused of uh, race painting or uh, trying to agree to a Western audience because racism in the MENA does not exist. And even if it exists, it's not the same way that it's happening in the United States or other parts of the world. Um, okay, sorry, I'm going to get depressed. I feel like I'm talking too fast. Um, my friends who are attending are sick of me talking about this. So sorry, guys. <laughs> um, and um, one of the things uh, that, um, was inspiring is also that um, the kind of knowledge production that started happening in the last years. Um, I think we're thick, uh, sick of convincing uh, groups and the feminist movement in uh, uh, in the main to see us, to include us. So what happened that people started creating their own platforms, creating their um, own spaces and putting forward the narrative and was the understanding that not just single, not a single group, a certain, certain, certain person, see the translation, <laughs> can represent uh, the whole MENA region. So you have different platform that is focusing on the experience of the MENA and slash SWANA, but you have groups and uh, individuals that focus on their experience living in their own countries. Um, one of those groups are the amazing work of the domestic worker movement in Lebanon, um, who are currently um, been giving a great example and expanding and pushing forward the discourse to include the intersection, not only when it comes to gender, and race and sexuality, but also labor and how do we see it and understanding it. And um, from what I know that they're also trying to expand it to other countries in, uh, in the MENA. Uh, Kafala system is a system that not only domestic workers uh, are under, uh, but most of the foreign or African workers who uh, come to um, our countries. Um, and there is a hidden violence in, inside of the kafala system where most of the women are under the direct uh, sponsorship of their parents or of their family 
which can lead to disastrous consequences. So you cannot have an education, work, move, travel without a direct authorization from your parents, which is mostly your father or the closest male, who is under a sponsorship by another uh, citizen. Uh, so there is so much work to do in that regard. Um, and uh, okay, connecting my thoughts. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what else? Did someone say something? I'm hearing a voice. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, another thing, uh, the production of knowledge is happening in different languages because uh, one of the things that we discussed that if your knowledge production is not is not in English, it does not exist. Uh, and it does not allow you also to look at your own language and think of what is missing. One of the things that we talked about that the word black is not something you're gonna be called even by the most progressive circle because it's considered a bad word. So you are referred to as a woman of color, dark skinned person, they're trying to negotiate not to say the word black. Um, racism and anti-blackness uh, did not exist in the literature. So, or is it a mere translation of another context? So how do we work with the languages and different dialects and different languages that we have? Um, the usage also of social media, because uh, when many groups started, uh, COVID is a reality that we've been dealing with for two years. I think for most of us, um, Social media became not like a second space that we log into, uh, but life. This is how we connect. And um, there's great work that's happening there, um, not only through the official websites, and but Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and clubhouses and WhatsApp. There is networks of care that is happening just because your community would not um, or your culture would not see you. That doesn't mean that you're not able to create a bigger communities of care. And that is what is happening across different countries. And it's diaspora. Um, one of the situation that um, I've learned a lot uh, through this uh, um, process um, of our need to also understand the histories and, and the context uh, of the different location. I had the same assumption that I know Maina. I've been living here for so long. Of course, I know it. Um, but then um, you are still faced by the fact that uh, when you read and your knowledge is, um, you know, constructed, you think of slavery as something that is part of the past. And then I sit across. Uh, great feminists from Mauritania, and they remind me that they're still abolishing slavery. They're still working toward that, and how that affects their work, and how many forces they're working against. The slavery in Mauritania um, is the last country where slavery was abolished uh, in 1981, and then was uh, criminalized in 2007, and then 2015. But until now, abolishment is not um, enforced. and um, and that's a, a huge reality check of the of the realities that we're living in, where in countries around me, black people are enslaved, and it's not um, a history. It's not something that we move past. And how can we understand those uh, relations and our position in all of this? Um, one last thing that I wanted to say, but it's. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, and uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, ask me, I will just okay. go, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Mai, for giving us that sense of all of the different ways in which Blackness, Black feminism show up in such a large and diverse region and the reality check. You mentioned the, the point about language and uh, Mpini, I, I, can I confess to having read your dissertation before this, before this oh, panel? Wow, because, okay. Yeah, no, because <laughs> I was like, ooh, that sounds cool. So if anyone hasn't read it, please look it up. It's great. Um, but you talk a little bit about language and the importance of different things in, in, in African languages and what that means. But Mai also talked a little bit about social media as a site for knowledge production. And you're the co-editor of the forthcoming book, African Women in Digital Spaces, Redefining Social Movements on the Continent and in the Diaspora. 
And you've also written about how Ghanaian women have used social media, but not for feminist agendas, but as a kind of pushback of sorts, mm -hmm. and but still kind of understanding themselves as gender activists, but to fuel more conservative and patriarchal agendas. So can you say a little bit more about the digital space as a site for contestation of African feminism? Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. But um, before that, I wanted to uh, speak a little bit to my um, comments about knowledge production, because I am really into that. And my recent work on built in philosophy basically looks at African feminist autoethnography and how we can pull from our communities, learn from our mothers, our grandmothers and, you know, our ancestors to to build knowledge. And I just want to connect that back to the earlier question about how African culture is incompatible with feminism. And I agree with the sentiments of um, Dr. Nyanzi that that is absolute BS, um, because a lot of my work is inspired by um, my Africanness. It's inspired by my community. And um, so, you know, a lot of the, even like with methodologically, like the research that I do and the theorizing that I do pulls from the knowledge in my communities. And I'm constantly learning how, you know, for example, in academia, um, African knowledge systems are often pushed to the periphery and the work that we all have to do to constantly, you know, center our communities and center our ways of knowing, you know, our oral epistemologies, our, um, you know, oral histories that are transmitted from generation to generation and philosophies within our communities that are not necessarily going to be taught in a continental philosophy class in, in you know, America or wherever. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. But now I'm going to go into talking about um, social media and, you know, organizing and activism. And, you know, the book that you mentioned, uh, in the book that you mentioned, we touch on topics around, um, it's a book that I'm co-editing with Dr. M.C. Akibona Clark of um, Howard University. And we explore topics around gender and gender expansiveness, um, sexualities, race, ethnicity, and how they interconnect with activism. And advocacy also pull that into rural um, life and the lives of rural women and how they, that connects to our work around advocacy. Um, and I also want to bring attention to uh, a current anti-gay bill before the Ghanaian parliament, um, which a lot of um, organizers within Ghana, um, like Silent Majority Ghana, LGBT Rights Ghana, are all um, doing work to sort of bring attention to and to see if we can um, push back on that. So I want us to think about digital media platforms and how um, they are situated within um, organizing and activism work uh, within the continent of Africa. And I'm gonna pull from my experiences doing this type of work as a scholar activist within the Ghanaian context and, and what that means. So some of the things that we are constantly um, taught or, or made to think about regarding um, digital media platforms is that their mere existence uh, means that there is some sort of progressiveness or there's some sort of social change that will happen. But it's important for us to understand that they can also be used for, they, they, their, their existence is not necessarily used for social good, but they can also be used um, by misogynists and, and, and fascists and um, queer folks um, and white supremacists for their own causes. And so the way that we use social media is what counts and not the mere existence of it. You know, so, you know, providing um, access to these platforms doesn't necessarily mean that we're moving forward in our um, advocacy um, work. So um, I also want us to think about what potential um, these digital platforms have for uh, radical feminist practices and organizing. Um, but as we talk about that, I want to acknowledge that there are so many people who probably would have liked to be here with us, but who are unable to be here with us because of the digital divide. First of all, because they, they don't own a laptop, they don't have uh, money to buy internet data to access the space, or they probably have both, but they don't speak the language of English that we're using here, um, or even the language that has been translated in, like Portuguese and Arabic and all of that, because they speak Dagwanli and Tri and Newe and Ga, um, Yoruba and all of that. Um, or because they have these, they, they have these um, platforms, but they can't navigate them. They don't have the technological literacy to be able to find their way here, even though they speak English, right? So as we do organizing within these platforms, it's important for us to think about these um, inequalities and how we may be reproducing that in the spaces that we're um, doing this radical work in and what we can do to sort of push back against that. 
And, and when, the work that we've done at SMG, we've always tried to see how, I mean, which SMG, we use a lot of digital platforms like WhatsApp and all of that. Um, but we always try to see how we could make sure that some of our work and our organizing diffuses onto platforms where people can easily access, like radio, right? So if you're on your farm in some faraway place, you can have your battery powered um, radio set and listen to whatever conversation is being had in the public sphere, right? Um, and all of these community spaces, how can we deploy our work or um, push political education on those platforms? And as we think about the digital divide, um, you know, various scholars have talked about it, various African scholars have talked about it, like Safiya Omoja Noble, Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, tells us a lot about the ways in which um, identities sort of interact with um, digital platforms and how that can reproduce um, um, inequalities in these ways. And, um, you know, various African scholars have uh, theorized about it. Uh, we know about Andre Brock, who's done work around it, Tim Nidgerbu, who I believe used to be with is it Google, um, also has talked extensively about that. Uh, Francesca Sobandi, who's a Black British scholar, has done extensive work around um, the ways in which um, Black women in Britain have used these digital media platforms to tell their own stories. Um, Simi Dele Dosekun has also examined um, these digital platforms uh, using, or even just examined the, the, the positioning of African women on these platforms and has also examined African women's um, sort of contributions or participation in um, post-feminist sort of circles and, and all of those things, which very intriguing book she has on that um, particular topic. And there's a recent book coming out, um, uh, co-edited by Hassan Hidayat of CDD um, in Nigeria on WhatsApp and how Nigerian women or African women are using WhatsApp platforms. So I was building up to come to this because I think that we don't use WhatsApp enough in our feminist organizing. We do newsletters that go through emails. My mom, uh, she is literate, but she doesn't use email. Um, she uses WhatsApp, right? So there is a huge population that we are missing out within the WhatsApp platform. Um, and we can learn from platforms like the continent and the ways in which they have sort of structured um, news dissemination to reach people on these platforms who are literate in English and who could benefit from this. So a lot of our political education as African feminists could be done through WhatsApp, through voice notes that are shared on WhatsApp, because there is like a, an infodemic that is happening. We saw that with the COVID pandemic and all of the misinformation and disinformation that was being shared on WhatsApp um, and how people were quick to sort of swallow that up and how all of that, you know, would, would, would be disseminated widely. Um, and I think that that is a space that we have underutilized in our organizing and in our political education to reach um, the masses. Um, and I also want to think to talk about how, for example, people who are interested in partisan politics use these platforms for campaigning and all of that. So it is a very ripe platform for African feminists to use in the organizing work that, that um, we do. So how can we rethink African feminist political education and outreach uh, using WhatsApp as a platform? And I think about WhatsApp as a platform, not just uh, focusing specifically on the continent or continent based, um, 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 or Africans based on the continent, but also uh, in our transnational sort of diasporic connections, because uh, I know that WhatsApp is also widely used in the Caribbean, in, in Latin America and all of these other spaces. And I think America needs to catch up. Group me is not it. Um, <laughs> so these are platforms that we can definitely use uh, in a lot of the organizing work or even just political education. And as we think about digital media platforms, a lot of the times we often think that they are divorced from reality. They're like, oh, she's, she's a social media <laughs> feminist, she only does her organizing on social media, but a lot of the people who do organizing on all of these platforms actually um, do work offline. And I believe that you cannot organize online without doing offline work to complement it, right? You can talk and talk about everything that you're doing online, but if it doesn't translate into the field or into the, I don't want to say the real world, into the physical world, you're not going to see action. And I'm going to use the example of Ghana when the Ghanaian parliament tried to um, spend $200 million on a parliamentary chamber when uh, we have, you know, dilapidated roads, we, there are school students who are studying under trees and so many other things that, that money could have been used for. Um, a women-led um, group came and did a lot of digital organizing. I mean, they got momentum 
the parliament was just not listening. But as soon as they began to organize to go out into the streets, that's when the parliament responded and decided to suspend that. And so it, I'm just trying to say that we can do organizing all we want online. We also have to complement it with offline action, which is very, very important. Um, and so beyond digital organizing, we have to think about um, organizing at the grassroots level, at our community level. And as African feminists, we need to do political education to empower people in their communities to be able to bring change to their own communities. Right. So a lot of the um, observations that I've done within the Ghanaian social movement space is that there are a lot of amazing groups that are doing great work, but a lot of them are based in Accra, which is the capital. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of that action reflect in rural communities. And I always I mean, I, I, a lot of my research focuses on people who don't necessarily speak English. So a lot of my research, I'll do interviews and focus groups in Dagwanli and then translate and then transcribe and all of that. And one of the things that I've found is that we often, you know, sit in our ivory towers, sit in our sometimes elitist spaces and think that rural people are automatically not radical. But a lot of the radical thinking that I have experienced has been in rural communities. They are the ones that are very often re responsive to, to bringing change to their communities. They are the ones that are often very responsive to seeing improvement in the lives of you know, marginalized people. Um, and we also have to do work around coalition building, you know, both internationally within our communities, within our nations, and also transnationally. And I feel like this space is really great. Um, you know, it is a really great space that, that demonstrate what transnational sort of um, community or community building sort of could look like. And I just want to wrap up by talking about feminist accountability, which ties back to the uh, topic, the, the conversation that um, Dr. Nyanzi brought up around um, women in high heels or feminists in high heels and all of that. And um, how I believe that critique is a praxis of love. And I think that we need more and more of that in our communities. I don't see enough of that. A lot of the time when people bring out critiques of our movements, they are often shut down. And I think that we need to be more open to um, having these conversations because uh, the response to critique is often um, like, oh, this is a personal attack on me. It's usually critique is focused on ideas and focused on you know, improving ideas, improving communities, not necessarily focused on individuals. And I think that that is something that we need to reorient um, ourselves to. And we also need to learn to hold ourselves accountable as we hold others accountable, as we do um, critique as a lot of praxis. And um, even within our digital platforms, one of the things that we, we, we need to do more of is to resist the urge to perform for the patriarchal gaze. It could be a Western patriarchal gaze. It could be an African patriarchal gaze. Um, and um, solidarity is also pretty important. And I'm hoping, I, I, I think of this space as a space where there has been some sort of intergenerational sort of knowledge sharing, which I'm very grateful for. And I hope that we can see more of that and we can have the difficult conversations around um, intergenerational tensions um, um, within our movement, something that Dr. Sylvia Bauer has written extensively about within the Ghanaian feminist movement. And I'm going to wrap up by going back to talk about the silenced histories uh, and um, the work that we need to do to unsilence them, to, um, to amplify um, these histories. So we see these silenced histories in the erasure of women in our textbooks that are foundational to our engagement with national histories, right? Um, we see this erasure of women in national currencies, right? So a lot of the time, you know your national heroes by the money. Like you look on the money, whoever is on the money is your national hero. And on our Ghana currency in the city, it's mostly men, the big six, right? It's all, always, you know, the men in them. We're not seeing people like Hannah Kudjo, like Dr. Mama mentioned, and so many other people who have um, supported um, Ghanaian independent movements from the onset. And also the erasure of women in the public sphere, um, through manuals, right, on our media organizations. And sometimes civil society organizations also participate in, in these types of erasures. And I hope that, you know, we'll be able to, you know, work towards creating more um, inclusive spaces where femin which are guided by feminist accountability, um, creating more inclusive spaces guided by understanding um, the importance of intersectionality to, to movement growth and um, solidarity building. Thank you, Wimpini. Those, I, I'm not even gonna attempt to summarize. I think 
what really resonates with many folks in the chat I'm seeing is the critique as a praxis of love. And the idea that at the space of tension and conflict can be generative, and those are the places that we, we shouldn't shy away from. I think it threads nicely with the high heels, which seems to be a theme, and also the ways in which we bring forward knowledge through generations, through uh, geographies, uh, through identities, um, and all of the methods that we do, including love that Nala brought forward. We only have five minutes left. I want to bring Stella and Riala back to the space. I want to ask you all just one closing question. If you could give me a word or maybe a sentence. What are your hopes for the future of transnational African feminist solidarity, movement building, community? And how do you see this Onge Mama series contributing to that? Oh, a word or a sentence? I know I've asked lots of difficult questions and then asked you all to be really brief about it, but it's, you know, that's what, it, that's what the facilitator does. So uh, who wants to go first? I can, the first thing that came to me with, uh, I like to fantasize a lot, sorry y'all, I really do, but I'm not sorry. Um, is this is the space where black feminists can actually embody rest and at that point of rest, right? Because just the act of choosing rest and uh, self-care, <laughs> which I think many of us do aftercare. It's like we reach burnout and it's like, now I have to do the aftercare, but the state of rest being the, the, the actually self-care, it's the reaching the point of we have done, we have seen, and we have experienced the hard work we put in. And I think we do that each day we see it, but at a magnitude where our chains are connected, that means I can look at my sibling next to me and know that they also have what they need. And I can look at the other sibling in another location and also see they have what they need. And I can look at another sibling in another location and have what they need. So that rest that I'm, I, I am saying is captured in the sense of uh, the sustainability and that space where everyone has what they need. So that is my hope. Thank you, Nala. I don't know if you saw it, but as you said, rest, it was almost like a shift in uh -huh. all of us. It was like a, an, a micro expression. And I think there's so much in that micro expression from all of us. Of, I think an acknowledgement of not enough rest, the thinking about rest in, in a radical way. Um, but that was really if interesting. Could, if I could just share one mm -hmm. thing, I think out of, out of the having the experience of doing that first trip was I never forced workshops. If people got up from the Airbnb and they seem tired, my first check-in is what does everyone need today? And if it's mm -hmm. rest, then we say rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The work will always be there. And so at times the, in the day folks rest and they got up and they ate and then they went back to bed. And so I say that <laughs> because sometimes what we need in the work and the, the knowledge of Black women feminists is rest as an act of resistance. Thank you. Who's going to jump in next? I jump in quickly and say Please. from the rest and self-care and healing, um, I hope that the Ongera Mama series will then contribute to retreat and rejuvenation and refueling. So as we rest, we don't vegetate and hibernate, but we also rest to refuel, rest to re-energize, rest to relaunch, um, but not rest to die. <laughs> we don't rest in peace, but we, we rest for the next leg or whatever. Mm -hmm. We rest to get ready. <laughs> Who else is going to jump in? I can. Okay. I'm very, I mean, I, I share the, this space has been like a, a rest for me. It's been beautiful. So I just want to state that out there and uh, share the love that I'm feeling here. Um, I've spent a huge amount of time alone this last year, uh, COVID, etc., And it's just wonderful. And I think what we do while we rest, really matters so 
learning to do less is something. Um, rest, restorative, rest to regenerate, rest to rebuild, rest to redefine, rest to just pause. And that's when we think is when we pause. And as an intellectual, I realize we're trained to do the opposite. So one is constantly untraining and detraining and learning not to be driven and to take space. And I can't wait to get out of the academy incidentally, but because of that, it's destroyed my brain. Uh, I kid you not. So, so, so this is a healing space and it's why I stay in these spaces. And I find them so much, of course, they're, they're for us. We make these spaces, they're habitable. So I would say for Ongi Mama, what a fabulous start. And I think there are many, many more conversations and we just need so much more of this. And now that we have the technology, I think these spaces carry us forward and it doesn't have to be in an explicit agenda way, that just the being and the becoming is what's going on in a space like this. And I congratulate the organizers and say continue. And uh, oh, there were so many more things to say, which means we must have more of these spaces. And I'm going to really look forward to them and continue to mobilize people into them. This has been fabulous. I, I like what we've talked about, both knowledge and emotion. So intellect and heart. And we're not in the room with the body. But I'm telling you, now that I felt the hug. So we can, we can do virtual love. We're getting better at it. And we should continue so I just want to be, I express gratitude. Thank you. Hakima, you've done a fabulous job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Who wants to jump in next? Riella, I see you speaking, but you're, you're on mute. May I just say, I tried to find Riella for about three months for the festival. Riella, we couldn't get you. Hey, hey <laughs> Amina, don't, don't bring the, don't bring the sites here. Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to say thank you very Happy much. Uh, this space has given me a lot of knowledge, um, especially for Mama Stella. Uh, when you started, I was like, whoa, Mama Lioness is wrong. <laughs> and I was just so I've, uh, I've taken a lot of points uh, from your point, and it's powerful. And hearing all the motivational words from all my sisters, my mothers, and my aunties, and all the people listening, one realized that you are not alone. We are all on the same journey. Maybe we are all from different roads, but uh, I'll take this word from one of uh, an album uh, launch. They say branches of the same tree. We are all the same tree. There are some of us are facing east, west, south, somewhere the sun is shining too much, somewhere the snow is, uh, but we are all together. We all feel the same when it's pain, when it's love, when it's peace, and we are all on the same course. It's just that we're all fighting it in our own way. Mm. The yes. internet. I think uh, we always frozen. Mm -hmm. Okay, gone. we're going to go back. Uh, because yeah. of the impact, some of us are older. We keep moving. We keep moving. Mm -hmm. We will get there. Yes, mm -hmm. we will get there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Riala. I and I, I want to add that um, mm -hmm. uh, Riala, Branches of the Same Tree is an album by Rocky Dawoni. Yeah, yeah, Rocky Dawoni. Yeah, Rocky yes. Dawoni. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that that also, reminds me, Wumpini, you mentioned lots of resources when you were talking. Would you mind please sharing those with, yeah, with, sure. with the organizers? And hopefully yeah. the organizers can get them to everyone who participated. We had over 100 and close to 150 people who came. A lot of folks were asking for those resources. And all of you, can I also, you all mentioned different books, different poetry. Please do share those with the organizers so that we can share them widely. Can I go to you, Wumpini, and then I'm going to go to yes, Mai? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my last words, are, I'm, I'm really happy to, this space was really enriching for me. And it's close to the end of the semester. And I've been running on steam like I'm hanging on by a thread and I really needed this I'm so thankful to all of you for this community and I'm so happy that I was able to share community with Riala who is my sister um, and I value the fact that this space um, created um, the opportunity for us to think about knowledge beyond the academy because we are learning from Riala and her music we're learning from poetry we're learning from 
you know, um, Nala's um, re um, accounts of um, the work that they're doing um, with their community. And I really, really appreciate that, this disrupting and, and decolonizing of what knowledge constitutes. Beautiful. Mai, can I turn to you? Let me unmute, too much pressure. Okay, uh, summing it up. Um, so I'm thinking of solidarity and uh, community care and what does it mean uh, is um, I have those big dreams that there's not enough time to talk about them, but uh, it's creating um, sharing not only of knowledge, but resources and um, lessons and economies and uh, love and spaces and sometimes you're able to rest when more, when people step in to take work that you think if you didn't do it today the world would stop and we all function on guilt in a way or another um you're able to rest when you know that you are surrounded by a village and you can ask for help without feeling like you're doing less or you're less um, useful to the movement in a way. And we can step away and come back and we still have a space. Um, we're able to rest when we feel like we don't have to spend some mental energy uh, negotiating which identity to bring forward and which one to leave in the back um, and which space can accommodate all of our nuanced experiences and that we're not translating but bringing someone to our house and showing them around and this is um yeah so uh the other thing that um and i also dream of um i have a love-hate uh, relationship with academy so i also dream of the time that um but it's important so i dream that the knowledge is no longer traveling to us we're not just here receiving we're not just being studied we're not subject our academy is amazing and it's producing amazing knowledge and that should not be taken lightly and um yeah so knowledge all around and african uh, universities and uh, knowledge that act challenges the way that we're being seen by the rest of the world and uh, i'm leaving this on a last note and it's important for me to say it um today is day 178 of the revolution since the since the co in sudan and um when it happens, the internet was uh, shut down by the government with, uh, or by the military coup. And we're being told as a Sudanese people, there's two choices, whether the military or Islamist. And those two choices are not good enough for people who've been working and uh, revolting for years now, two years, uh, since 2019, uh, going through COVID, going through internet shutdown, going through, um, economic collapse but they didn't stop and it's still peaceful and while it's happening while Sudanese people are asking for uh, freedom Sudanese feminists are working on many fronts and fighting and pushing against military rule but also pushing against comrades who are telling them now is not the time to talk about feminism now is not the time to talk about sexuality or gender and um, just keep your eyes on Sudan because the amazing work that happened and everyone taking Sudan as their own country and their own home made a huge difference. So let's not also forget Sudan and other places. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Yamai. Can I say thank you to the organizers, to the folks at Black Women Radicals and African Women Development Fund for creating a space of home and belonging for us today. Thank you for giving us a space of rest and conversation. Um, and as Mai said, all paths through the people of Sudan and the people of Africa. Um, and we will leave it here. Thank y'all so much. This was so great. Honestly, I want to say um, that I've been fangirling over here. I've read, I know everything about y'all. I've always wanted to work with you all um, and doing this work with Black Women Radicals and working with the African Women's Development Fund has been a, just an amazing experience. So thank y'all so much. It was so enriching.
No. I would like to say, please follow us for updates on what is coming. There's only um, the prelude um, to the series and please follow us and we will be sharing updates on um, events as they have to roll them out. Thank you. Lydia. I just want to say thank you all, um, Black uh, Women's uh, Radical and African Women Development Fund. Um, if you haven't heard it, and I texted Jamie about this, was that I felt like this was definitely a blueprint of the way that knowledge should be shared. And so thank you for creating a blueprint and the continuations of our mother's mother's blueprint. So thank you. And I just wanted to say that before we left that you feel that what you've done today has been beyond the seed that you may not know that you planted today. So thank you for the seeds.